Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Scribble Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number three of Operation Gold Strike. In our last two episodes, we have managed to scan Minmus and land our ground base that can do the drilling. Now it is time to get a space station over around there. So to do that, we are going to launch the first module of that space station, and then later we'll bring up some crew. So for those two things, we have a couple new craft, and this is the first one. This is the core module, and it is greatly inspired by the concepts of the functional cargo block that was the first module that went up to the International Space Station. In the case of the ISS, if you remember watching in Project Gateway, that provided electrical power and storage, propulsion, guidance, all for that initial stage of the assembly of the ISS. The version for the ISS had been built by Russia and was launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in November of 1998. It went up into about a 400 kilometer orbit. It had been designed to fly autonomously for only about six to eight months, but it actually had to go for two years due to delays before the second module came up and docked with it. The ISS version was about 19 tons. Our version is around 26, a little over that. It will serve the same basic purpose though. It's the one that's going to have the engines that we'll be using later and carries most of the fuel. It has a docking port on it for refueling and a couple for crew craft and one that's going to connect to the rest of the station once we can bring that up. There's a large section where the crew can live even if they come up to just this small version of the final station, composed of some living quarters where they can keep their life support as well as a large science bay. It is mostly assembled except for one small piece that's going to need to be moved off to the side. If I had been able to install Infernal Robotics, then I could have had an antenna on the side that rotates up. But in this case, we'll do it with a small docking port. We'll undock this tiny antenna, shift it around to the side of the station and stick it on there and then open that up for our longer range communications. As you saw right there, the solution I came up with for how to strut into the fairings was to not strut into the fairings. Instead, I used these rails that ran all the way up the side, and then I strutted from the top of the payload into those rails. I may go back and alter the craft from episode one or two that was having its wiggliness issues and throw some rails in there to make it easier for people to launch. Right here, I am activating the fuel flow from these two tanks that can power the first module of our, I'm going to call it the Kesla Serenity Station, number two. Those tanks had been disabled because I was only using a docking port to connect this to the fairing base. Fuel is normally allowed to flow through a docking port, and I didn't want the lower stage that we've already released to drain all the fuel from this, and then have nothing for this once we got to orbit. So yeah, I think I will go back and add rails to the base that we already launched, even though I have already finished with that one. They were on decouplers, so after the fairing was released, I was able to activate those and they shot off like rockets. This initial launch is going into an equatorial orbit because that will make it easier to assemble the rest of the station here. When we transfer it over to Minmus, then we can make our maneuver at one of the nodes for the ascending or descending that will allow us to adjust our inclination and make the intercept at the same time. So here we are up at our 300 kilometer orbit now and the last step is to move that communications antenna I talked about earlier, shift it over, redock it up. It's extremely maneuverable so you have to turn on fine control mode with caps lock in order to really have any control over it. Once that's docked up on the other side we open up the comms and our first launch is done. It is time to bring some crew up there and they can get everything situated so that when the next module comes up, it's ready for docking. However, before we get to that, let's look a little bit at some of the details on this initial launch. The total launch was 223.426 tons. You can see the bottom started off with a thrust limited to 87% 
Mammoth engine. That was to keep the thrust to weight ratio down to about 1.66 right there. Technically at sea level, it's going to be 1.55, which is just fine because by the time we get to orbit, it would technically be at 4.0, which means we're going to throttle back a little as this thing gets higher and the mass goes down. One thing to note there, you guys probably already know this, but just in case, in the new version of 1.0 of KSP and higher, engines have thrust values that change over time like real engines do. If you pull up the stats on an engine like the skipper right here, see how it says max thrust, absolute sea level, 568.75. Max thrust in a vacuum, 650. That's because the ISP right here is changing. In this case, it's going from 280 at absolute sea level up to 320 in a vacuum. Just like in real life, engines now have a constant fuel flow. The same amount per second will drain out of the fuel tanks into the engines, but the ISP will improve as it goes higher, and so effectively the max thrust is also going up. Okay, anyway, we'll move our way up here, and you can see all along the side of it we have more lights. A few fuel tanks working our way up into here where we have our retros right there, big engine for the upper stage, and there you can see how I did the rails. So the way that I did that is I went over here and grabbed a piece like this fuselage and I pulled this down initially and I put that right there and this was attached there and that allowed me to get in there and access this easier and put down these little cubic struts and then I put the decouplers on top of those and then another cubic strut on top of the decoupler. Used the offset tool to shift this one a little bit more toward the edge stacked a couple more cubics on there and then when I was all done I took this back off pulled this back out and reattached this right there and that made it look like it was nicely lined up there with a stack of cubic struts going all the way up the side until it docks right here with a strut to the top all right so we'll go back down to the bottom and pull that whole segment away you can see that we have two little solar panels on there because this stage doesn't use very much power just to keep it in orbit. We have our orbital maneuvering engines right there, and this will be the docking port for supplies. So if we have to bring up extra fuel, it can dock there and pump it straight into this tank here and this tank here. This unit is supposed to be an autonomous unit, just like on the ISS's first launch. So for that reason, we have a probe core here and a battery to power it. This is also where we're keeping our RCS and monopropellant. I don't need this section to be balanced because it's not really going to be docking to anything else. So there are only these four down here for kind of flipping the thing around and rolling it around. But other than that, since it doesn't need that balance, we don't have a counter set of RCS up here toward the top. So now we move into our living areas. We have two docking ports for crew to be able to dock to the main living areas here where we have our science and our sleeping quarters and life support up there. Some green lights indicate where all of the docking is, so you can see green lights all around these spots here, here, and up here at the top. Now you're going to notice that I have a bunch of antenna around the outside in different places. There's four of them down here, and there's a couple of them up here. Obviously, you only need one, and in fact, we have a communications dish right there, but I think that these make it look kind of cooler, since that's what the real ISS modules are like. They have antennas all over the outsides of those things. And speaking of antenna, that's the last piece we have right here. It is connected by a little teeny docking port. We have a small amount of monopropellant and some RCS ports pointing in the different directions right around on here so that we can then maneuver this thing into position and that position is right there. It also has its probe core to control it while it's doing that as well as to control the communications antenna. Or at least in theory, I'm pretending that that's what's happening. Now you are going to notice that I have done things like cover up all of the EVA doors, like this one right here, and that is on purpose. This is not intended for story purposes to be an airlock. By covering that up, I prevent my Kerbals from being able to go out that door. And there's also a door that's on the science facility, and that has been covered up by these as well. Down here, the only ones we have were the ones we've added. So this will ensure that the only way to get in and out until we have a chance to add our airlock to the facility it is through the docking ports that we have added. And for story purposes, we will only ever go in from these two right here because this will be where the rest of the station is and that's for supplies. Now before that quick trip to the VAB, we were launching our crew. However, I didn't show you how I knew when to launch my crew, so I'll do that real quick. 
It's pretty simple really, once you're out at the pad, you just go out to the map view, look at where the station is, and wait until it's rising over the horizon on the back side of Kerbin. So you can see here, it's at the top, we're going to wait until it comes all the way around to the bottom because mission control and our launch site is down on the bottom right. Then we keep watching as it comes around and once it gets right to that line where if you had some binoculars or a telescope or something, if you could look up in the air and see it coming over for the very first time, that's when you're going to want to switch back and launch. So that returns us to the present where we have Bob and Valentina on board our crew transfer vehicle. You will certainly see some similarities between this and a couple real world launchers. For one thing, the four boosters that drop away are obviously reminiscent of the Soyuz. But up at the top, what you're probably going to be thinking about is perhaps an Orion when we get to having our vehicle completely exposed. All of the wiggling that you saw in the last episode has been taken care of, so there's nothing special that needs to be done for this launch. It's just a standard gravity turn, as if you didn't even have a target. Once the booster has been fully drained and dropped away, and then we hit the action group number one to release the escape tower, then we can start thinking about what we're going to do to rendezvous with our space station. We'll re- We'll release our side protective shroud panels and then power up the engine where it's time to switch out and take a look at the map to make sure that we're going in the right direction to rendezvous. I noticed an ascending node right in front of me so I decided to activate my maneuver at that location where I'll have the maximum flexibility on all the different directions we could travel, either prograde, radial out, or normal up and down, and start out by dragging a pretty good decent chunk of prograde, followed by a radial out maneuver to make sure that the maneuver node is a little bit off the horizon still, and adjust to make sure that the ascending or descending node will end up right at my apoapsis, which also intersects with the target orbit. At that point, it just takes a few more drags here and there of prograde and radial to figure out where the intercept is going to occur. And in this case, it's going to be about a half a orbit further ahead. I'm not sure if you hear it well, but I'm using a mod called RCS Sounds. And right there, as you saw, my RCS was firing to put me on my maneuver node. In my headphones, I'm hearing these cool little bursts, like whoosh, whoosh, to represent that RCS. And it just sounds so cool. I highly recommend that one. Even if you're not really a mod kind of person, some of these beautification and immersion mods are, are pretty awesome. So out here at the map view, we are still at full throttle right on that maneuver. Although as is usual for me, I will be deleting the maneuver node and then just watching my orbit, watching for the close approach indicators to line themselves up. Also on the left hand side at the bottom of my flight computer window, it says close approach distance and I'll be watching that as well. And once that's really close, I fully throttle down to zero and use my RCS keys to continue adding a tiny bit until we see that our intercept is extremely close to the station. At this point, I need to make a decision. There's a little fuel left in that lower stage, but if I go any higher with it, then it's going to end up being orbital debris. And there wasn't much left in it, so I decided to let it go. It'll go back and be destroyed and not become debris, but at the same time, now I've lost some delta V. We'll see whether that decision comes back to haunt me later. For now, I'd like to make one more maneuver to bring myself up out of being suborbital and create a second intercept with our station. We've already got one. We knew that we could get there if we wanted to, but we'll be going relatively quite fast once we get there. And maneuvers are cheaper up at the apoapsis, so I'm going to do this maneuver that will keep our intercept with the Kessler Serenity but also reduce our relative velocity when we get there. And just in case, at least be orbital rather than suborbital. So we have arrived at Kessler Serenity, and if you look at the time to closest approach, it is ticking down and I'm only at half throttle. Ah, oh, brain fart. Which means the Kessler Serenity goes zipping by at high speed before I realize what was going on. I just wasn't paying enough attention. So then we go full throttle, stop all that relative velocity, and start back toward the Kessler Serenity. 
At this point, I can maneuver solely on RCS. And that's a good thing, because remember earlier when I was saying it will remain to be seen whether I should have saved the fuel in that lower stage to do a little extra maneuvering with it before releasing it? Well, now we have our answer. Look at the sliver of fuel that's left on our crew transfer vehicle. That sliver is not going to be enough to get us back down to the surface later. Fortunately, we only need a tiny, tiny bit more, which we can siphon off from the station. But in general, I would think that that's not the approach we want to take. What we should be doing is bringing up to the station fuel, having a little bit more than we really need, and then dropping off the excess before we go back with just what we need to deorbit. That way, if this had been a real world, real life sort of thing, where even at higher altitude, away from the atmosphere, there would still be drag, we could use that to do occasional orbital maneuvers to make sure our orbit stays up high and nullifies the drag. I suppose in the future what we could have done and should have done is used that other stage that we got rid of until there was only a tiny bit left in it, maybe 100 meters per second, then decoupled and it had a CPU core on it. We could have flipped it around and done a retro burn to deorbit and not worry about the orbital debris that way, but instead I got rid of it early just because I was sort of being lazy, really. I didn't want to have to switch back to it later to do the deorbit burn, but that would have been the better choice. If we'd done that, we'd have had enough. So maybe it's not so bad. This crew transfer vehicle will be sufficient to do any kind of low carbon orbit maneuvers. Well, there we are, all docked up. Bob and Valentina can switch into the station and check it out, make sure everything is ready for the next module that's going to be coming up, and settle themselves in for a couple weeks of stay. So let's check out some of the construction tricks going on in the crew transfer vehicle. Down on the launch clamps, we have some lights attached to provide some illumination on the sides. There are four boosters on the outside, and each of those has some sideways angled retros to make sure that we don't damage the core like we learned previously. Using the standard construction techniques, there are some retros on the lower core so that when this decouples right here, that will go away as well. I also embedded some right here, their eulage style, to make sure that the bottom and the top separate away equally from this little interstage. Scrolling our way up, you see that when this one decouples, it also has some retros. And that brings us into the meat of the transfer vehicle. We need to look at the action groups to see what's going on with some of these. Action group one gets activated once we are out of the atmosphere. Number one will decouple from a Clampatron docking node right there, the escape tower. It will also deploy from this one right here, some fairings that are using a, being used as a shroud to cover up the actual capsule. I had to use a docking node in between the heat shield and the fairing base because both of the decoupler styles that are this size were sticking out too much into the area where the side shroud was supposed to be. In other action groups, we have an abort key set up to activate the launch tower, deploy the shield that protects the capsule, and undock this node right here. Number two toggles the solar panels, three puts out the antennas, and if I should want to do it by action group, I have seven set up to decouple this node right here to release us. Although most of the time I'll be just clicking on it in game probably and just saying undock this node and then let this release. Down on the bottom, we also used an interstage style of fairing placement to cover up with these panels. The inside here that has all of our little bits like our solar panels and RCS for when we're up in orbit. We have a backup fuel cell right there just in case we need some power from that. Communications dish right there and an antenna right there. And of course the outside always has more lights. The RCS is embedded around the outside edge here, the monopropellant. There's also an extra battery. You can see the tip of it right there. That battery is used for an additional power for re-entry, just in case re-entry takes a while, then we'll still have power on the capsule on the way back because the base capsule has 150 electric charge and that might not be enough. So I added that one for a little extra. We also have a light right there for docking. You can see the docking node is right underneath the escape tower right there. Also, hidden underneath the docking node, right under the edge here, 
you can see that I have embedded some parachutes. We have one drogue chute and one normal chute that I can use for my re-entry. Four activates the drogue parachute. Technically, we could stage it over here, but for the next one, I want to cut the drogue chute and deploy the regular chute. So since I was already going to put that on action group five, I decided number four could just be to deploy the first chute. So you hit four, bring out the first, five cuts the first and deploys the second, and six, will give us a soft touchdown with some embedded boosters inside the capsule under the heat shield. Now the way that these side fairing bits go on, let me just show you that real quick. When you say you want to build your fairing, if you just pull this up here and watch that text right there, it's orange at the moment, but watch it's going in and, and green, you already know what green is. That means that you can place a section, but watch when it turns blue right as you get it up to the next piece up here. See that right there is blue, so if I left click, now I have released the fairing, and that turns it into an interstage rather than needing to close the whole top. I did the exact same thing up here with this one. This is essentially a side fairing and not a full fairing, where we put a small section just to cover up the base, but then took it all the way up here and did the blue style interstage instead. So if I click right there and close it, notice it doesn't have to have a point. It becomes a side interstage fairing. Very useful for creating shrouds. And so that is just about, oh no, there's one more thing. So you are going to see that I have stacked several fuel tanks here in order to make it be, because the game only has 1.25 and 2.5, but I want something that's halfway in between. So what I did was I put one tank down the middle that was the 1.25 size and then embedded six onto that. However, leaving the fuel would have been like cheating. So instead, all of these outside ones have been reduced down to 36 liquid and 44 oxidizer because technically that's how much would be in that little sliver of the outside there. So this makes sure that even though I'm overlapping all of these tanks, the overall amount of fuel in everything in here is still balanced with every other tank. I simply used the pi r square times height to calculate the volume that this should be, compared that to the volume of tanks over here, like this one or this one, got the number of units of liquid fuel per cubic meter of space in there, and then averaged it out in between the 1.25 and the 2.5 radius, or diameter I mean. The middle tank still has full fuel, but these outside ones have been reduced and then overall it stays balanced. So that is it. If we take away all this, you can see that it's just your basic capsule, heat shield, docking port, and everything else that we've already gone over. And what's that right there? Well, that's going to do it for this time on Operation Gold Strike. In the next episode, we will launch this module you can see right here. It's a very large module that will run up and down the center of the new space station. After that, we have one or two more launches to go to complete the station, and then we'll send it to Minmus. I think I'll try to do it in just one more instead of two. That'll be quite the challenge, because there will be multiple pieces that will have to be broken apart and put all back together again in the right places and it could be quite a large fairing with all the last modules in the last flight. But then again, look at the size of the fairing on this one. It's already big, so we're setting the precedent. Ah, let's go for the challenge. We'll try to do it all in one. Well, we'll see how it goes on that one. But until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.